The Phantom Menace opens at midnight. The place in the Star Wars line. We started lining up over a month ago. All right, get out your lightsabers. You just may have noticed that Star Wars, the latest episode, opens nationally at midnight tonight. The hype surrounding this movie has been overwhelming. Now the question is, will it deliver? They're about to open the doors here in just a few minutes, and people are revved up. Some 2.2 million Americans from New York. The lead up to The Phantom Menace is unlike anything we've ever seen before. If you want to see how far nerds are willing to go to show off their love for their favorite franchises, just look at the way fans were acting before The Phantom Menace came out. The movie released in May of 1999, and the November prior was the first time any footage was shown to the public with the first trailer. Nowadays with YouTube and all other forms of social media, we can just hop on our phones and watch the newest trailer. But back then, fans Fans couldn't do that. You wanted to see the new trailer? You had to go to the theater. Fans would buy tickets to go see other movies, watch the trailer for The Phantom Menace, and then leave when the trailer was over. You actually paid to go in to see a movie just to see the trailer, and then you left? Yes. Cause it's an awesome two and a half minutes. A few months later, when the second trailer came out, fans all over the internet tried downloading the trailer, which ended up breaking the entire internet. A few weeks before the release of the movie, the marketing campaign really began to ramp up. On a day called Midnight Madness, toys went on sale for the movie. Fans could get their hands on their Darth Maul and Jar Jar Binks action figures. And let's just see what fans were like on Midnight Madness. Stuff, do you think? Uh, no, but I got a limit. Actually, I was only gonna come in to buy one figure, but I ended up getting more now. Yeah, so, and I see you got the lightsaber there. Oh yeah, heard you guys talking about it, so I figured, well, might as well extend the credit limit a little. Uh, I spent $324. $320? $324. Uh, $227, I believe. Yeah. Was yeah. it worth it? Uh, I guess so. If, it, if it's worth money, I it guess it's it? worth it, yeah. A few weeks later, and The Phantom Menace was only days away from being released. Long before the days of online ticket buying and reserved seats, fans had to wait in line if they wanted to go to the first viewing of the movie. I'll be honest, I'm jealous. Sure, buying tickets online is convenient, but the experience of waiting outside in line for hours or days even must have been so much fun. But on May 19th, 1999, the Phantom Menace released in theaters, and people had thoughts. Before I dive deep into The Phantom Menace itself, I want to analyze one aspect of the prequel trilogy as a whole. Eventually, I plan on doing videos on Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, so what I want to do is devote a section in each of those videos discussing a topic that applies to the prequels as a whole. With my sequel trilogy reviews, I did the same thing. So within my discussion of The Phantom Menace, I want to discuss a topic of movie discourse as a whole. And this does apply to The Phantom Menace more so than it does the other two prequels because this was the movie that modern online discourse really started with. So many people, especially those who are my age, love to point to The Last Jedi as the movie that ignited this modern movie discourse on the internet. And that's a fair observation. But frankly, it really started with The Phantom Menace, went away for a while, and came back with The Last Jedi. Movie discourse as a whole has developed into nitpicking and strange comparisons. In preparation for this video, I watched a bunch of reviews of The Phantom Menace prior to the release of The Force Awakens. Because there is a clear shift in how the prequels were talked about before 2015 and after 2017. If you watch videos after 2017, which was when The Last Jedi came out, they are almost always positive. And if you watch videos prior to 2015, when The Force Awakens came out, they are all mostly negative. This is because the wide disdain of the sequels has caused fans to reevaluate the prequels, usually to a more positive effect. Also, we are now in an era where liking the prequels is really cool, which was unfathomable to think about in the mid 2000s. The point I am trying to make here is that film criticism is largely dependent on the present day movie culture. So for example, today when I go into the comment sections of prequel praising videos, I will see countless comments along the lines of, the prequels at least had a thought out plan and a consistent vision for the trilogy. Of course, the reference here is the sequels because they had no initial plan. If you were to watch videos from a decade ago, they would crap on George Lucas for being too controlling over his movies and not letting other people challenge his ideas. This 
This is in reference to the originals having a lot of people surrounding George Lucas and providing new and unique ideas. Talking points heavily impact film criticism, and that is something I hope to avoid in this video. Of course, I will make connections to other projects in the franchise because that's only fair, but I'm not going to base my praises or criticisms of these movies based on what the other movies failed at. I'm sorry, but saying the prequels are good because they have a consistent vision is one of the dumbest praises for these movies. Having a consistent vision should be the bare minimum of what makes a good trilogy. That's like texting your girlfriend out of the blue and thanking her for not cheating on you. Thanks for committing to one of the most basic parts of our agreement. So just because the sequels lacked a plan, that doesn't mean that the prequels are good for having one. And the same could be said the other way around. I think the sequels look far better than the prequels. And no, it's not because they're newer movies. The approaches they made to making the sequels in terms of having real sets and practical effects and different directing styles from George Lucas is something I really appreciate. But again, that's kind of the bare minimum for making a fantasy movie. So the sequels aren't automatically good for, again, doing the bare minimum. One trilogy lacking something doesn't make the other good. Now, the other thing I want to address about film criticism is nitpicking. Prequel criticism prior to 2015 and sequel criticism today have so much nitpicking it's embarrassing. Nitpicking is fine and all, but when you use it as an attack on the movie as a whole is when you've gone too far. For example, in A New Hope when the stormtrooper bumps his head on the door. People today look at that moment and laugh as a silly mistake that was made. But they only have this approach because the movie is really good. If this moment happened in any of the prequels or any of the sequels, people would say, oh, George Lucas is an idiot or J.J. Abrams is an idiot. They don't care about Star Wars because they're lazy and let shit like this happen. Moments like these happen in all the Star Wars movies. You're not going to see me bring up how there's a kid-sized helmet in the N1 Starfighter as a reason why this movie is bad. You may disagree with me and think that the Cinema Sins approach to reviewing movies is a good example of film criticism. All the more power to you if you believe that. But that's not what I do here on The Goldman. So if you're hoping to get a review where I look at every minuscule detail that will end up taking four hours to cover the whole movie, then this video is not for you. But if you want a more balanced and objective analysis, then this is the place for you. I'm going to try my best to provide unique perspectives about this movie. The Phantom Menace has been out for over two decades. Almost everything about this movie has already been said. I'm not going to sit here and talk about the subpar acting or Jar Jar being annoying or a lack of practical effects. This has been repeated for over 20 years. Let's move on and try to find new things to add to the conversation. But also, since almost everything has been said about these movies, I'm not going to be able to provide a 100% original analysis. So don't crucify me if I make a point that another YouTuber made too. I'm trying my best here. So with that all out of the way, let's begin. Let's talk about the plot. Of all the peculiar decisions that have been made in this movie, this is the one that is the most jarring. The plot of The Phantom Menace is about stopping this illegal invasion of Naboo. A lot of people like to poke fun at this movie for supposedly having a dumb plot, but I've always disagreed with that. It's a pretty simple plot that I think could work for a Star Wars movie. The issue here is that what's actually going on in this movie is all over the place. There are kind of three plots in this movie. Saving Naboo, training Anakin, and Palpatine becoming Chancellor. So the opening sequences of this movie are about them going to Naboo and escaping, which makes sense. Then we gotta go to Tatooine for a significantly good portion of the movie. So at this point, the plot kinda changes to focus on Anakin rather than the actual battle of Naboo. Yeah, there are some scenes that discuss what's going on on Naboo during this Tatooine sequence, but not many of them. Then we go back to Coruscant in one of the most boring sequences of the movie, where instead of focusing on saving Naboo, it seems to focus more on Palpatine over overthrowing Valorum. And then after nothing is accomplished, our characters just decide to go back to Naboo anyway and fight with the Gungans to save the planet. My biggest issue with the plot of this movie isn't so much the plot itself, but rather the agency of saving Naboo. We are told countless times how people are being thrown into camps and that there's a lot of people dying on Naboo. Naboo is supposedly suffering a lot from this invasion, but we don't see any of this. Sure, we see some security volunteers die, but all we actually see is just the droids roaming the streets. In order for your story to have momentum, your plot needs to have agency. For example, in A New Hope, we need to get the Death Star plans to the Rebels so we can destroy it. As this happens, we see Alderaan get blown up. We know the danger, we see the consequences of it, and the characters need to act quickly or else more people will get hurt. Besides the brief sequence of escaping Naboo, our characters are almost never in any active danger until the final battle. And since we never actually see why the Trade Federation is so bad, there's no rush in the viewer 
viewer's eyes to resolve the issue. Now, the movie could have done something really interesting. I said that we should see the damage that the Trade Federation is doing to Naboo. If Lucas doesn't want to go down this route, then what he could do is add an aura of mystery around the state of Naboo. After our characters leave Naboo for the first time, we are shown numerous holograms from Seal Bibble with him pleading to Padme to contact him back and send help because people on Naboo are dying. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan tell Padme not to respond because it's a trap set by the Trade Federation. Now, every time Padme watches one of these holograms, there's added tension because we don't really know if this is a trap or if the people on Naboo are actually dying. Will Padme contact them back? Boom! Tension. But the movie makes a critical error in actually showing scenes of people on Naboo. And yes, the Trade Federation has people captured, but we can see that nothing is going on and that everything is kind of fine. This removes any tension from these hologram scenes. If you take the exact same movie that currently exists and remove any scene on Naboo that takes place between the crew leaving for the first time and coming back at the end, the movie would be far better off. Sometimes less is more. A great bit of writing advice I once got is that it's important that your reactions to the plot align with the characters. If the characters are worried about something, so should the viewer. And at this point, the viewers are not concerned about Naboo. When thinking about this movie, I actually realized that The Phantom Menace is quite similar to Thor Ragnarok in terms of its plot. There's a homeworld that is under threat from invaders, our heroes are separated from said homeworld and are rushing to get back, but in the meantime, they are stuck elsewhere and they need to accomplish other goals before returning, then they are able to return and stop the invaders. So yeah, the the two movies are vastly different, but the plot structure is similar. Now, Thor doesn't do what I said before about not showing the homeworld in the middle of the movie, but in Thor, we do see how Hela is wrecking havoc on Asgard and killing plenty of people. The Phantom Menace should have had something like this. The part of the movie that has the worst pacing is easily the Coruscant sequence. People love to say that Kanto Bite or the Droid Factory or the Pasana sequences are the worst sequences in Star Wars, but I attest that this Coruscant sequence is the worst of all the movies. If you're someone who loves this scene because you're captivated by space politics, then good for you. I enjoy it too. The Clone Wars does a great job at it, but the politics here in The Phantom Menace are so boring. And you know why? Because none of it matters. But Goldman, this sequence is important because we see how Palpatine became Chancellor. No, that is not important at all. In the context of just this movie, Palpatine becoming Chancellor has no effect on the plot. Whether or not Palpatine is Chancellor, the movie pans out the exact same way. Its only purpose is to stall the characters from actually going back to Naboo. In the context of the entire trilogy, I'm sorry, but how Palpatine became Chancellor is not important. The trilogy could have began with him as Chancellor Chancellor and his manipulation of the Republic in the preceding films would have been just as interesting. Sure, the stuff with Anakin in the Council is kinda important, but not important enough to detour the movie for an hour and a half. Now, you would be right to point out that the whole reason this invasion is happening in the first place is because Palpatine is trying to overthrow Valorum. Yes, this is true, but I ask you this again. Is this actually important? If you were to change the movie so that the Trade Federation actually wants to invade Naboo instead of just listening to Palpatine, and Palpatine is just the Chancellor at the beginning of the movie, again, nothing really changes. If Palpatine's plan to become Chancellor is super interesting to you, that's awesome. But to me, it's just added fluff to the prequel trilogy. Anyway, while the movie itself made strange decisions with its plot, I think the strangest decision of them all is that this is the story that Lucas wanted to tell as the first movie of the trilogy. People love to shit on the sequels for not being planned, and fair enough, but at least that trilogy had a consistent plot line through the movies. The first one shows a war start the second one shows our heroes struggling in the war, and the third one shows the resolution of the war. Execution aside, it's fairly simple and consistent, and the same could be said with the originals. With the prequels, the first movie is about some random ass conflict, the second one is the beginning of a war, and the third one is the conclusion of that war. For a trilogy that was planned throughout, I find the structure of it to be rather poor. Frankly, episode one feels more like an anthology movie than an actual Skywalker saga film. Back in the day before Disney bought the franchise, people loved to discuss the proper viewing order of the movies. One common suggestion was the machete order. You would watch 4 and 5, then the prequels, then episode 6. Except a good portion of people would recommend you skip episode 1 entirely because it's not important. Everything that is important about The Phantom Menace is perfectly summarized in a few lines in Attack of the Clones. Saying The Phantom Menace is important to the prequels is like saying Rogue One is important to the originals. Sure, it adds a lot of context, but it's not necessary. Now you may say, Goldman, Anakin's relationship to his mother is an essential part of the prequel trilogy. And this is true, but do we need to see that relationship in The Phantom Menace? I feel like if you start the trilogy with Attack of the Clones, and 
Anakin's relationship to his mother he hasn't seen in a decade could be inferred, because the viewers understand the relationship between a boy and his mother. Anakin's mom's death scene in Attack of the Clones is a great scene, but you don't need to see The Phantom Menace to appreciate how great of a scene it is. So those are my issues with the plot of not only The Phantom Menace itself, but its existence in the trilogy. I don't often do rewrites in these years later videos, but I really want to do one here. My rule for rewrites and shows is that you can't just restart the story from scratch. You gotta take the existing story and make minor tweaks to make it better. So I'm going to make some tweaks to The Phantom Menace and a few in Attack of the Clones that I feel would have made the trilogy better. So The Phantom Menace begins almost the exact same way. There's an invasion by Naboo by the Trade Federation, Qui-Gon and a slightly older Obi-Wan go to investigate, things go poorly, they go to Naboo, they rescue Padme, and they leave and crash on Tatooine. When we meet Anakin, however, we see Hayden Christensen's version. Aging up Anakin in The Phantom Menace is not an original idea at all, but it's one that's crucial. Anyway, they still have the pod race, Anakin leaves his mother and is freed as a slave. We go back to Coruscant and Palpatine is already Chancellor. Because of the Republic politics, they don't help Naboo, and then the rest of the movie plays out the exact same way. So now that I think about it, I didn't really actually have any changes with this movie, besides aging up the characters. But what I am going to change about Attack of the Clones is going to make The Phantom Menace significantly more relevant in the trilogy. In Attack of the Clones, we learn there are separatists, but never are we told why these systems want to secede from the Republic. In my rewrite, Attack of the Clones will take place immediately after The Phantom Menace, and the reason systems are seceding is because of the way the Republic handled the Naboo crisis. Tensions have been boiling, then seeing how the Republic ignored Naboo's call for aid has pushed systems over the edge. We also learn that the reason Palpatine was manipulating the Trade Federation was not so he could become Chancellor, but so he could ignite outrage and start a war. With this change, the plot of the Phantom Menace becomes incredibly important. And with Anakin's story, since it takes place right after the Phantom Menace, his relationship with Obi-Wan is still rocky, and he's not as strong in the Force, but has gotten a little training. The movie plans out the exact same way, but instead of wanting to free his mother because he hasn't seen her in a decade, he just senses things are wrong and wants to go back. Shmi still dies from the Tusken Raiders, and Anakin is pissed. So those are kind of my rewrites. With a few changes, The Phantom Menace becomes far more important to the trilogy and connected better with Attack of the Clones. So those are my issues with the plot of The Phantom Menace and how I would change it. Before I continue on with the rest of this video, only 9.8% of my viewers are subscribed to this channel. So if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you. When it comes to Star Wars The Phantom Menace, the characters leave a lot to be desired. In fact, the movie can be seen as an exercise in how not to create interesting and engaging characters. While some characters like Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi have their moments, overall the characters lack personality and agency. If you've watched my other videos before, you'll know that I usually devote sections to talking about each of the important characters. And when I was organizing this video, I did plan on having a Qui-Gon section, an Anakin section, a Padme section, and so on and so forth. But then I came to the realization that I would be basically complaining about the same things with each character. So might as well just combine it into one section and briefly discuss each character. In preparation for this video, I watched a bunch of these why the prequels are secretly brilliant videos because I wanted to understand what I'm missing here. I want to love everything Star Wars, so it would behoove me to try and let others convince me. Now I hate lumping a bunch of people people into one group and saying they only like X because of Y, I think that's a terrible way to approach film criticism, but in my experience watching these videos and reading comments, most of the time, it appears to me that people love how rich and deep the prequel story is instead of defending the actual movies. George Lucas has a reason for everything he did with this trilogy. Whether you like it or not, Lucas put an incredible amount of thought and detail into the prequels. Within every aspect of these movies, movies, there are layers behind what's going on. But just because something is deep, that doesn't mean it's well conveyed on the big screen or that it was a good narrative decision. For example, when critics point out the flaws of the Jedi and how they are all idiots, some will argue that this was intentional to show how flawed they are and why the Jedi ultimately fell. While this may be true, it still doesn't excuse the fact that portraying your main characters as idiots is never a good idea. Similarly, when it comes to Padme, some may argue that her monitor 
monotone voice and lack of emotion was intentional, to show how queens of Naboo are trained to be stoic and emotionless. However, this approach ultimately fails to make her a relatable or engaging character. Making your characters emotionless robots is simply not a good idea. So when I go discuss the characters in a second, someone is going to bring up what was said in a novelization or what was said in an interview depicting George Lucas's genius. But at the end of the day, none of it matters if it wasn't properly conveyed in the film. First, let's look at Qui-Gon. Qui-Gon Jinn is a Jedi Master and is one of the central characters in The Phantom Menace. He is a wise and skilled warrior, driven by his sense of duty to the Force and his desire to train Anakin Skywalker. However, despite his important role in the story, Qui-Gon's backstories and motivations are never fully explored. While we know that he is a Jedi and he has a close relationship with the Force, we are never given much insight into his past or what drives him. Why is Qui-Gon so close to the Force? Why is he so invested in prophecies? Why is it so important to him that Anakin be trained? To me, it just seems like Qui-Gon is someone who is really good at his job of being a Jedi. I don't know why the human being Qui-Gon Jinn cares so much. This lack of development can make it difficult for the audience to connect with him emotionally. Some fans argue that Qui-Gon's lack of a backstory and motivation is intentional, that it emphasizes his role as a mystic and a prophet, driven by an unshakable faith in the Force. This interpretation suggests that Qui-Gon's character is intentionally enigmatic, as he is meant to represent the mystical and spiritual aspects of the Jedi Order. From this perspective, Qui-Gon is less of a fully realized character and more of a symbol or an archetype, embodying the ideals and values of the Jedi, or at least what they should be. While this argument has some merit, it cannot completely erase the fact that Qui-Gon's character lacks the emotional depth and development that audiences crave. Even if Qui-Gon is meant to represent something larger than himself, he is still a character in a story, and stories are driven by characters with motivations and desires. Without a clear understanding of what drives Qui-Gon as an individual, it can be difficult for the audience to fully invest in his character and feel emotionally connected to his struggles. This can make his death at the end of the movie feel less impactful, as we have not given enough of a reason to care about him as a person. Imagine if we learned that Qui-Gon once ignored a prophecy, and because he did so, some tragedy broke. Or maybe his old master studied prophecies, and when he died, Qui-Gon felt the need to continue his master's research because it was a way for him to connect to his old master. I know Count Dooku was his master and was well alive, but when The Phantom Menace came out, we didn't know this. There are a few lines here and there that give us a hint at Qui-Gon's personality. We know he loves to defy the council, and he's also a bit morally gray, willing to rig a game of chance. Many point to these instances in The Phantom Menace as reasons why he's so intriguing and unique for a character in Star Wars. Sure, that's true, he is unique, but he's only unique because every other Jedi is the same. They're all emotionless assholes. A lot of criticisms I've directed towards Qui-Gon could also be directed towards Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan Kenobi is one of the most iconic characters in the Star Wars franchise, but his role in The Phantom Menace is relatively minor compared to every other movie he's in. His character arc in this film is underdeveloped and non-existent. One of the main reasons why Obi-Wan feels underutilized in The Phantom Menace is that he doesn't have a clear personal goal or motivation. While he is instrumental in defeating the Trade Federation and helping to free Naboo, he is largely reactive to the events around him rather than driving the plot forward on his own choices and actions. Unlike Qui-Gon Jinn, who is driven by a sense of duty and belief in the Force, Obi-Wan doesn't have a strong sense of purpose or agency that distinguishes him as a character. Does Obi-Wan want anything in this movie? It seems that all his desires in this movie are reactionary to what Qui-Gon wants. You may counter and say that Obi-Wan is not the main character in this movie, so he doesn't need to be as fleshed out. Okay, fair, but isn't that a bad thing? Obi-Wan and Anakin should be the most important characters in this trilogy. Having Obi-Wan be a side character for one of these movies is a waste of a movie. Another missed opportunity with Obi-Wan's portrayal in The Phantom Menace is that he lacks the wit and humor that fans have come to associate with the character. He doesn't have many opportunities to showcase his personality or sense of humor. This is a big missed opportunity as Obi-Wan's wit and charm are major parts of his character in the original trilogy and the other prequels, and could have helped to make him a bit more relatable and engaging. All those traits about Obi-Wan in the Clone Wars that we love so much are not present in this movie. He makes like one comment about how negotiations were short, and that's the extent of his personality. So Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan lack many qualities that make their individual characters interesting to me. But what's more disappointing than that is the lack of a dynamic between the two. Their interactions with each other are minimal and lack any real depth. There is no banter or playful teasing that would make the relationship more relatable and enjoyable to watch. Instead, they come across as stoic and formal, with Qui-Gon being the more dumb
dominant figure in their interactions. This dynamic further hinders their chemistry, as it feels more like a working relationship rather than a close friendship. One quality of storytelling I often talk about are moments where two characters are in a room alone together and are just talking about how they feel. They aren't talking about the plot or their concerns with defeating the villain, they're talking about their biggest fears. They're being vulnerable with each other, which allows not only the two characters to bond, but also the viewers to bond with the characters. A lot of people crap on Attack of the Clones and say it's an awful movie and it's a worse movie than The Phantom Menace. Those are fair points, but what Attack of the Clones undoubtedly has are moments where characters talk to each other about their feelings. There's this moment in the beginning of the movie where Anakin tells Obi-Wan about his nightmares and how the state of his mother keeps him up at night. This is a great moment that gives us an insight as to who Anakin Skywalker is as a human being with flaws and fears. There's another moment earlier in the movie where Obi-Wan yells at Anakin and tells him they're not going to go through this exercise again. Sure, the dialogue comes across as kind of cringe in these moments, but again, we have a clear understanding of their relationship. Obi-Wan and Anakin do care about each other, but they're often frustrated with each other and they struggle to be on the same page. You know those scenes between Anakin and Padme that everyone loves to make fun of because the dialogue is so bad? I don't like sand. People ignore that these are moments that help us understand these characters and see them as human beings. People shit on the scene where Anakin yells that he killed the Tusken Raiders and not just the men, but the women and the children too. I genuinely like that scene because it's Anakin just emotionally dumping everything on Padme. He's angry and he acted like a human being who just watched their mother die. These are what good movies need. I just went on a huge tangent there, but with that all being said, can you explain to me the dynamic between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan? And don't reference some book or some interview. Use scenes and examples from the movie. The only thing I can glean from their relationship is that Obi-Wan often gets frustrated a lot with Qui-Gon. And that's it. There is one and only one good scene in the movie between these two. And it's right before the battle and Obi-Wan apologizes to Qui-Gon. He says he's sorry for not being grateful for his master's training and Qui-Gon responds by saying how wise of a Jedi Obi-Wan really is. But one scene like this isn't enough. Even when Qui-Gon dies, Qui-Gon only talks about Anakin. When Vader died, he spoke about how grateful he was for his son and how Luke was right that there was good in him. Qui-Gon decides to talk about someone he met the other day. So the relationship between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, or lack thereof, is one of my biggest disappointments about the characters. Anyway, let's finally move on to another character in this movie, and that will be Padme. Right off the rip, I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything for you. I do not like Padme at all, in any of these movies. She is a terrible character. Of the three movies, I probably like her in Attack of the Clones the most. One of my largest issues with Padme is unfortunately her portrayal. I teased this thought earlier, but her emotionless demeanor in almost every scenario infuriates me. I don't care if this was the point. There is nothing you can bring up from the books or interviews or anything that will convince me that having Padme act like a robot for most of the movie was a good idea. In movies and shows, I want characters to express their emotions, not hide behind some political mask. If you were the king or queen of a planet and it was being invaded and no one believed you, wouldn't you be pissed? The closest we get to that is Padme slightly raising her voice during one of the Senate scenes. Without engaging characters to ground this story, all the political maneuvering and Jedi philosophy in the world can't make this movie feel like anything other than a slog. This issue ties into a larger issue I have with a handful of different characters, and that's their overall lack of agency. It's not until the end of the second act that Padme makes an active decision to go back to Naboo. For most of the first two-thirds of this movie, she just follows Qui-Gon around, expressing her thoughts and opinions that are ultimately ignored. Her home planet is currently currently being invaded and her people are dying, and she's casually having dinner with two slaves. Something about that just rubs me the wrong way. If the main characters lack urgency about saving Naboo, then the audience won't treat the crisis as something that is urgent. The first time Padme treats the situation with any sense of urgency is when she tells Palpatine she is going back to Naboo. There's this subtle look that Palpatine gives, almost as if he's surprised with Padme's decision. From this point onward, Padme is a serviceable character because she's making decisions that show how much she cares about the invasion of Naboo. Like when she begs Boss Nass to help her in battle. I still hate the acting, but at least we get some emotion. So overall, Padme's lack of agency for most of the movie frustrates me. Moving on, Padme is given very little backstory or personal motivation in the film. We learn almost nothing about her beyond her political role as queen, and she never shares any meaningful moments with any of the other characters besides the moment she comforts Anakin. Outside of this one scene, we don't have any understanding of who Padme Amidala is other than that she's a queen who cares for her people. This lack of depth makes it hard to care about her or become invested in her character arc. As a result, she feels like a flat, one-dimensional character, which is a disservice to Natalie Portman, who's a fantastic actress. All I want in these movies are people who are motivated
motivated by something other than their job profession. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but speaking of somewhat well-developed characters, let's talk about Anakin and Jar Jar. Yes, you heard me right. The two characters in this movie that people seem to hate the most are the characters I believe to be the most fleshed out. For both, you have a good understanding of their personality and their motivations are clear. Anakin is a boy with a heart of gold, but he was born a slave. He wants to help people in the galaxy and he has strong aspirations to become a pilot. He's kind, selfless, and inquisitive as well. When it comes to parental figures in Star Wars, mothers usually get the short end of the stick. The relationship between fathers and sons is more prominent than any type of parent-child relationship, but everyone knows the bond that a little boy has with his mother, and that's beautifully conveyed in the relationship between Anakin and Shmi. But there is one major issue I have with Anakin, and it's not so much the character himself, but what George Lucas decided to do with Anakin, and that's him being the Chosen One. I hate the Chosen One prophecy so much and for so many reasons. For one, I just hate the concepts of Chosen Ones in general. It's a lazy plot device to artificially add importance to a character. Instead of a character having a skill that makes them important or earning the respect of anyone else, they were just born important and nothing about their character traits makes them important. Having Anakin be the Chosen One also makes the Skywalker family seem holy in a way and I don't like it. In the originals, Luke was just some kid of some random guy that used to be a Jedi and became evil. But now with the prequels, Anakin is literally the Jesus Christ of Star Wars. He was born without a father, and he was prophesied to destroy the evil people. The reason this bothers me is because making Anakin the Chosen One doesn't really change the story of the prequels. If in The Phantom Menace, Qui-Gon takes Anakin's midichlorian count and sees it's really high, then he can be like, oh, this boy must be trained because his midichlorian count is high, let's bring him to the Jedi Temple. And then in Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, literally nothing changes. I'm serious. If Anakin isn't the Chosen One, and instead he's just some random dude who's really strong with the Force, absolutely nothing changes in Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Just say Palpatine wants to turn Anakin to the dark side because he's powerful, and the story turns out the exact same way. But you know what's the biggest reason why I hate the prophecy? It's because now in Return of the Jedi, when Vader kills Palpatine, it's no longer about him saving his son. It's about him fulfilling the prophecy of destroying the Sith. Even before the Rise of Skywalker came out, I still hated the prophecy because that would mean that every time a Sith appears after Return of the Jedi, then people were going to complain that the Chosen One prophecy was ruined. But of course, with Palpatine's return in The Rise of Skywalker, people are saying that Vader's sacrifice was ruined because Palpatine returned. Now, I'm not here to defend Palpatine's return. I hate it. But when people say Palpatine's return has ruined Vader's sacrifice, I get triggered beyond belief. The stupid-ass Chosen One prophecy was not once mentioned in the original trilogy, and Vader's sacrifice was recognized as a great scene. It is still my favorite scene. But because it was said a few times that Anakin was destined to destroy the Sith in the prequels, the original trilogy is now ruined? That logic baffles me. So the Chosen One prophecy only adds convolution to the Star Wars saga rather than enhancing it in any way. I know I went on a bit of rant there, but going back to Anakin in The Phantom Menace, I like that he feels like a real human being. Sure, the acting of a 10-year-old Jake Lloyd wasn't great, but I don't have high expectations for acting in Star Wars, so it doesn't bother me one bit. Moving on to the other supposed well-developed character, let's talk about Jar Jar. There is probably no character in the history of Star Wars or maybe even cinema that garnished more hate than Jar Jar Binks. You may argue that Rose Tico deserved that title, but no, it's not even close. Sure, Jar Jar may be annoying at times, but I just don't think he's that bothersome. If I had to list the 10 biggest issues I have with The Phantom Menace, Jar Jar doesn't make the list. When you sit down and actually think about Jar Jar Binks, he's easily the most well-developed character in the movie. He has a clear personality, he is goofy, clumsy, he talks too much, and he's a good person. His motivations are clear, he may have been banished by his people, but he still cares about them and wants to fight to protect them. And he's the only character in the movie that has some sort of arc. He goes from being banished for being clumsy to becoming a general and a hero in the battle that saves Naboo. As silly as the story was, it's still an arc. My biggest issue with Jar Jar is that half the time, I have no clue what the hell he's saying. I'm telling you, watching this movie with subtitles for the first time was like watching a completely different film. So even though Anakin and Jar Jar are by far the most hated characters in this movie, they are unquestionably the most three-dimensional, and I have to somewhat applaud that. Another character in this movie I do appreciate is Palpatine. It may honestly be the acting of Ian McDermott, but he steals every scene he's in. Even the boring-ass Senate sequence is somewhat watchable because of Palpatine. My biggest criticism of Palpatine is that I find his entire plan to become Emperor way too convoluted, but I am going to dive way deeper into that when I eventually speak about Revenge of the Sith. But speaking of the Sith, I have something to say about Darth Maul. I know people love him, but in this movie, he is the epitome of everything I could dislike in a villain. 
villain. Darth Maul is a guy who looks cool and fights cool. And that's it. There is no development for the character. If you've ever watched both versions of Justice League, you can notice a difference in the way Steppenwolf is portrayed in both. In the Joss Whedon version, he's basically the same as Darth Maul, except he doesn't look as cool and he doesn't fight as cool. He has no depth. The Zack Snyder version attempts to give Steppenwolf the bare minimum of character development. If Darth Maul got this bare minimum of development, I would have been okay with it. There are a lot of characters in this movie. I get that not everyone can be developed, but I just would have liked something from Darth Maul. Frankly, what Dave Filoni was able to achieve with Maul in both The Clone Wars and Rebels is one of the most impressive feats of storytelling I have seen in a franchise. But just looking at the movie, Darth Maul is bland and boring. And those are my thoughts on the major characters of The Phantom Menace. I will say this quickly, I hate Nuke Gunray with a passion. He is the biggest idiot in the galaxy and his death in Revenge of the Sith brings me immense satisfaction. But most of the characters in The Phantom Menace I find to be poorly written and underdeveloped with a few exceptions. To wrap up this video, let's discuss the Battle of Naboo. While I do love stories and character arcs and all that boring shit, I just as much love to analyze battle sequences and what makes them effective or not. So while I've been quite harsh on this movie overall, I do have a lot of positive things to say about this final battle, but I also have a lot of negative things to say. So the Battle of Naboo is split into four different parts, if you will. We have the ground battle between the Gungans and the droids, we have the lightsaber fight between Qui-Gon, Obi Obi Wan and Darth Maul, we have the space battle, and we have Padme and company running through the castle. I would prefer to analyze this battle as one battle, but these four mini battles are mostly isolated from each other. Sure, the Gungans attacked, so forces would be drawn out of the main city so our main team can sneak in and get to the main hangar. But after the opening sequence, none of these four events besides destroying the command ship affect each other. A great example of a good battle I'd like to think of is the Battle of Scarif. First, the troops go to the ground to get the plans, they set off explosives to distract the Imperials, then the Rebels show up which causes the shield gate to close, so Churret needs to flip a switch which leads to Bodhi needing to tell the Rebels to destroy the gate, which leads to the Rebels destroying the gate, which leads to Cassian and Jin being able to transmit the plans. See how there's a logical progression of things that need to happen in the battle for the Rebels to win? With the Battle of Naboo, the Gungans divert Trade Federation forces so some pilots can sneak in and get to their ships so they can go to space and blow up the command ship. Mind you, there's only only one command ship, while in the beginning of the movie there were dozens. So sure, there is some logical progression, but everything besides destroying the command ship happens in like the first five minutes. Also, there is borderline no struggle to accomplish any of these tasks besides blowing up the command ship. All the Gungans needed to do was show up in the beginning. Then our main crew sneaks into the hangar rather easily and reaches their ships no problem. Meanwhile, in the Battle of Scarif, each one of those tasks that I mentioned before took a lot of effort and the death of a few characters to accomplish. Accomplish. The same cannot be said for the Battle of Naboo. In order for a battle to be engaging, there needs to be high and low points. If there's no struggle, then there is nothing engaging about the battle. So let's look at the four individual battles and see how entertaining they are on their own merits. First, we'll look at the Gungan battle. From a conceptual point of view, I actually quite like this battle. Of all the Star Wars movies, this is the only one where we really get a big ground battle, with troops fighting each other. Sure, we get glimpses of other ground battles in Star Wars, but none of them have the struggle of a proper battle like this one. With Geonosis, it's honestly just a lot of action until the lightsaber fight. The Battle of Hoth is more so speeders versus AT-ATs rather than people versus people, and the Battle of Krait is also just speeders versus AT-ATs. So with the Gungan battle, I love that it's a proper ground battle. Also visually, at the time, this was a masterpiece. It doesn't look so great anymore, but for its time, it was surreal. And besides that, it was mostly just meh. Most of it is just mediocre action until the Gungans lose the battle, and then once the command ship is destroyed, all the droids are dead and they win. So the battle looks cool, but there's no depth to it. Up next is Padme storming the castle. Frankly, this portion of the battle is useless. Sure, capturing the Viceroy is important, but Padme and company could have easily just waited until the command ship was destroyed, walked through the castle unopposed, and then capture new Gunray no problem. Earlier in the movie, Padme says without the Viceroy, the droids would be lost and confused. Without the Viceroy, they would be lost and confused. 
What does this mean? That's not true. Without the command ship, the droids will be lost and confused. Not without the Viceroy. I guess you could argue that the Viceroy would escape once the droids were destroyed, but I have a hard time believing these two morons would be able to escape on their own. So while this sequence was entertaining because the action is pretty good, it's ultimately not important to the battle and kind of a waste of time. Up next, we'll look at the space battle. My hatred for this space battle cannot be contained. Sure, the visuals still hold up rather nicely, and the music is still great, but having Anakin accidentally do everything right in this battle, including blowing up the space station, is something that drives me insane. This may seem simple, but one of the most important things your characters in a story must do is make decisions. Again, it sounds trivial, but let me explain. When your characters actively make decisions, it reveals to us more about the character. When Qui-Gon goes out of his way to take Anakin to Coruscant, it reveals to us how much he values the prophecy. If your characters don't actively make decisions and are just reacting to the events around them, then you don't learn anything about them. For example, Anakin volunteering to help Qui-Gon and Padme by participating in the pod race is an active decision Anakin made. He didn't have to do this, but because he did, it shows us that Anakin is a boy who likes helping people. On the contrary, Anakin accidentally pressing a few buttons that leads to him flying into space and destroying the command ship is passive because we don't learn anything about him other than him being the luckiest person alive. If Anakin showed off his piloting skills and actively won this battle for Naboo, I would be a big fan. But George Lucas decided to rob Anakin of any agency and therefore this space battle sucks. Lastly, let's discuss the lightsaber fight. This part is easily the most iconic part of not only the battle, but the entire movie. The music here kicks ass. We all know how great John Williams is, but I think people underestimate how important music is for a scene, especially a lightsaber fight. And the Duel of the Fates soundtrack carries this fight hard. Of course, the choreography is mostly well done. I could be annoying and nitpick this fight as much as people nitpick the throne room scene in The Last Jedi, but I'm not going to do that. This battle has wide angles and long takes that makes it rewatchable. Now here comes the hot takes. I find this lightsaber fight to be overrated. I like my lightsaber fights to have an emotional emotional conflict between the characters. Fights where the characters are talking to each other, and we see how their conflicts resolve. A big reason I find the Anakin and Obi-Wan duel in Revenge of the Sith so much better than this fight is because that fight involves two people who used to be brothers fighting each other. With this fight, they're just fighting because they need to fight. A few years ago, there was this discussion Dave Floney had where he spoke about the importance of this fight. He said the reason why this fight is called Duel of the Fates is because they're fighting for the fate of Anakin. Qui-Gon knows Anakin needs a father and that if he dies, Anakin will be in big trouble? This argument is baby back bullshit. If the stakes of this fight are that Qui-Gon cannot die so he can train Anakin, then why is he here in the first place? Couldn't he just leave? Sure, you could say he's there because he wants to help the people of Naboo or that they need to investigate the Sith, but if being alive for Anakin, aka the kid he believes is the chosen one, is so important, then why does he have to risk his life? He can't ask one of his Jedi friends to go on his behalf? There are thousands of Jedi and none of them could sub in for Qui-Gon? I have a fun analogy I love to use that compares to this line of thinking. Say I'm a father and I have a baby. One night I proceed to drink so much liquor to the point where I'm belligerent. Then I go driving where I get on a highway and drive 100 miles per hour. If I all of a sudden while driving have an epiphany that I cannot die or get arrested because if I do my child would be orphaned, sure the drive becomes important, but should you have any empathy for me? No, because I'm either an idiot for putting myself in a dangerous position in the first place or you'd think I don't care that much about my child. This is how a logical person would analyze the duel of the fates, but the same standard isn't held for the fight. Also, if Qui-Gon values Anakin's life that much, why on earth would he take him to the middle of a war zone on Naboo? Just leave him on Coruscant, or if you have to bring him to Naboo, leave him with Boss Nass, who isn't a part of the battle. Going back to my drive of the fates analogy, imagine the same situation with the car, but I brought my baby with me while I'm drunk driving. If I value this baby's life and well-being so much, why on earth am I bringing it with me while drunk driving. If your counter is that Qui-Gon wanted Anakin to get some battle experience, then he's a terrible father figure because Anakin is a kid who is nine years old and he's not a Spartan child from ancient Greece. Frankly, before this interview with Dave Filoni, I assumed the importance of this fight solely revolved around the fact that a Sith Lord showed up for the first time in a thousand years. And I'd also prefer it this way. So this Dave Filoni defense is nonsense because his argument falls apart upon an ounce of scrutiny. That was a fun rant I just went on. But despite that, I still enjoy 
enjoy this lightsaber fight enough because of the music and how well it was directed. And those are my thoughts on the Battle of Naboo. Even though there are a fair amount of parts in this battle that I do enjoy watching, overall I find it to be a lackluster battle that compared to other great battles in Star Wars and other franchises leaves a lot to be desired. So, The Phantom Menace all these years later, how has the reputation of this movie changed? As I've mentioned way earlier in the video, this movie and the prequels as a whole are seen in a more positive light now. But going back to 1999, the fan response to this movie was menacing, pun intended. Fans felt like George Lucas ruined their childhoods and that Star Wars was dead. What's so fascinating about this is that the sequel trilogy basically got the exact same response. And I love hearing people say the sequel backlash was different because those movies are genuinely bad movies unlike the prequels, the amount of ignorance that goes into a statement like that is astounding. Regardless of what you think about any of the prequels or the sequels, both trilogies had fans when the movies first came out that were abused online for liking a movie. Only now it's been almost 20 years since the prequels concluded and fans have grown accustomed to them being a part of the canon. History always repeats itself. I have no doubt that 10 years from now fans will look upon the prequels and the sequels in a different way than they do now. Even though The Phantom Menace is my least favorite of the 11 Star Wars movies, there's something unique about it that makes it a bit more rewatchable than some of the other Star Wars movies. Even though I like Attack of the Clones more, everything that's unique about Attack of the Clones is just done better in Revenge of the Sith and The Clone Wars. But since The Phantom Menace feels more like a spin-off than a film in the Skywalker saga, it has a little bit more to offer. When I watch The Phantom Menace, I don't feel like I'm watching the first movie in a modern Star Wars trilogy. I feel like I'm watching a 1999 film that happens to be Star Wars. It's a retro movie to me and I kinda like that. And those are my thoughts on The Phantom Menace all these years later. Thank you everybody so much for watching another one of my videos. Don't forget to the Claude Squad and I will see you guys next time.